We're carrying on with our back to basics. And actually what we're going to talk about this morning is the remembrance. We've, we've just experienced it. We have just um, observed it once again. And as we've said, we're, we're thankful for that opportunity. But it's, it's good as, as we're in this back to basics series, just to revisit things that we kind of know, but maybe there are some things that we, we're not always sure why we, why we do things the way we do them. And so that's part of uh, our reason for revisiting uh, some of these things that we, that we already know and are to some extent familiar with. Now, we're kind of a, a bit out of season <laughs> at the moment because our Remembrance Day in Canada and, and in most um, Commonwealth countries, of course, is November the 11th. And it's a day that has been set aside. It's related to um, uh, Armistice Day of uh, the First World War when um, uh, peace was signed and those kinds of things. So that's, that's why that day was selected. But it's a day of remembering not just the First World War and the sacrifices of that, but the conflicts uh, around the world since then and people who, um, soldiers and others in, in um, service roles who have given their lives. Uh, and so the purpose of of um, Remembrance Day or, or Poppy Day um, is is to think about that kind of human sacrifice and for us of course to be thankful for the freedoms that it brings to us. I think pretty much every country around the world has some kind of, of Remembrance Day whether they call it Remembrance Day or Veterans Day down in the US or Memorial Day. In fact that's what they call it in Israel today they have a day that's called Memorial Day which is specifically for remembering um, conflicts, uh, even in terms of the modern state of Israel and, and the very birth of the modern state of Israel was birthed in conflict. Um, and I think I've mentioned in, in previous times that in, in, a, in a previous uh, work opportunity I had, I, I visited Israel several times. And I clearly remember one time I was in Tel Aviv in Israel and it was on, on what they call their Memorial Day. Uh, and I was just traveling um, to somewhere, visiting a customer, probably in a rental car. And there was an air raid siren across the whole city. And everybody stopped. Literally every single person stopped. Every car on the highway stopped. Everybody stopped. People got out of their cars and for the next two minutes were just quiet stood by their vehicles or stopped doing what they were doing and that was that was their moment of remembrance on Memorial Day now I know in our uh, remembrance day we, we have 11 o'clock as well and, and and I suppose we're meant to do the same thing ourselves but you don't really see it to the same extent I don't think um, in our experience so that was really quite uh, quite striking to me at the time this whole idea of remembrance and the importance of remembrance is something which is, which is really uh, deeply rooted in, into the psyche of the Jewish people. In, in modern Israel today, they have 20 public holidays throughout the year. 11 of them are specifically to do with some aspect of remembrance, whether it's Memorial Day, whether it's Holocaust Memorial Day, um, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, um, one of them, of course, we're very familiar with, apart from Yom Kippur, we read about that in the Bible. But the one which it, we most often read about in the Bible is still a high profile uh, remembrance occasion for the people of Israel. And they call it Pesach, which is the Passover, the special annual Passover um, celebration and feast. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 12 and just remind ourselves it's a story. Uh, that we're all pretty familiar with, I'm sure. But we'll just do some reading in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, verse 21, Moses called for the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. 
and you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you as he has promised, you shall observe this rite. And when your children say to you, what does this rite mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. And the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. So we have this um, picture of the families of Israel in the land of Egypt. And this is, was God's final plague, of course, uh, so that the people uh, would come free. And the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, would finally listen to the voice of God. But they had to make sure that the destroying angel would pass over their homes. And they did that by putting, daubing the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, uh, the sides and the top, and making it very clear. Uh, and so the angel of death would pass over and the Israelite homes would not be affected. And because of that, Pharaoh said, go. And the people of Israel went and began their journey ended up in their wanderings in the wilderness, of course, but ultimately arrived at the promised land. So uh, the Lord's command was to, was to keep that Passover every year. And it was a solemn festival for them. And what they do in the Passover celebration is they are remembering. They are remembering what God did for them, the great deliverance and salvation that God achieved for them in bringing them out of the land of Egypt. And that is essentially what the Passover celebration is about. It's a remembrance of God's great salvation and deliverance. Not just that though, but also what God that subsequently did because God then brought his people and he entered into a covenant with them. And he gave them special privileges and there's everything that flowed from the Ten Commandments and the uh, Levitical offerings and the fact that God chose this people and said, we were thinking about kingdoms this morning, and says, you're going to be, you're going to be um, a kingdom to me. And God chose this people and he took them into a promised land and he said, this is where we're going to settle. And this is where I am going to settle with you. I'm going to live in your presence. So it wasn't just about them being saved out of their slavery in Egypt. That was a magnificent, a marvelous thing in itself. But it was so that God could bring them into all the blessings and all the things that he'd promised them. And that was always God's message to Pharaoh. Let my people go so that they may worship me, so that they may serve me. That was God's purpose. Uh, and so that's what uh, was achieved. And so the, the, the Jewish people coming together at the Passover was remembering uh, and making sure they never forgot uh, what God had done for them in bringing them into uh, the promised land and bringing them into this special relationship with him where they would worship him the way that uh, he had specified and that brought honor and glory to him. So some 1500 years then after that initial Passover experience um, and many Passover celebrations, we come to another Passover celebration. And this one is very special because in fact, it's, it's the last Passover. It's not the last one that's ever been kept, but it's the last one that ever needed to be kept as far as God was concerned. So we'll turn to Luke chapter 22, please. When the hour had come, he, that's Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, you will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. The Lord gathering his disciples together in Jerusalem to celebrate this special 
annual Passover feast. This wasn't the first time the Lord had done this. He'd surely done this at least, well, probably at least two times, perhaps three times prior to this occasion. But did you notice what the Lord said? I have desired earnestly, as my Bible translation says, I've earnestly desired. Now, as you know, the New Testament was written in the Greek language and the literal meaning of the word that is translated there means that the Lord Jesus set his passion upon. Now, that's quite an expression, isn't it? Why do we think the Lord was particularly earnestly desiring and passionate about wanting to celebrate this Passover? I've earnestly desired to celebrate this Passover. Partly because he knew it was going to be his last with them. Um, although he told his disciples time and again what he was what was going to happen to him, they hadn't always hadn't always clicked with them. So they might not have realized it. But the Lord knew. So that was part of it. But I think a bigger part was because what the Lord was going to do, how the Lord was going to transform uh, that remembrance um, ordinance. And so as we've read, the Lord went on to take the elements of the Passover meal that they had celebrated that were already there on the table, the bread and the wine, and to give new symbolic significance to them. And we're very familiar with that symbolic significance. The bread, um, as the Lord himself said, representing his body, which is given for us and the wine representing his blood and the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for us for the remission or for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's remarkable, isn't it? The simplicity of these emblems. And there's, there's no great mystery shrouded in them. And we often say, and it's reflected in, in, in our hymns as well, that it's just bread and it's just wine. But it enables us to do something which is very profound and very special and very important for us. Remembering the Lord in the way that he said and obeying that command again as we were reflecting uh, this morning. So the eagerness of the Lord and the passion that he had to want to celebrate this one, I think is very much related to the fact that he was introducing something new as part of the new covenant, an ordinance, a rite, a celebration that is connected with being a part of, of the new covenant. And the Lord says, you do this in remembrance of me. So the Passover as as it was known up till that point and its purpose up till that point, as soon as the Lord Jesus did this with his disciples uh, in the upper room that night, the, the Jewish Passover, as we might refer to it as, became something that was, was no longer of particular significance in God's eyes. Because really, for the people of Israel, it was a remembrance, it was a looking back, but there was also an element that it was a looking forward. There was a looking forward to God who would ultimately, who would provide the ultimate Passover lamb. And in the New Testament writings, that's how Jesus is referred to. Uh, the Passover lamb that has been sacrificed for us. So Jesus fulfilled it. That's the point, isn't it? Jesus fulfilled what the Passover pointed forward to and how the, the Jewish people up to that point used it to look back. So in that sense, because the Lord fulfilled it, there was no... No longer a need for them to continue it in its, in, the, in its previous form, which is why the Lord did what he did and said, here's, here's the new significance of these emblems of this bread and this wine. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, please. <clears throat> this is what the Apostle Paul had to say about what we refer to as the remembrance. Now remember the Apostle Paul wasn't in the upper room with the Lord and the disciples that night because he got saved later on, as you remember the story on the road to Damascus. So he, he only met the Lord and came to understand the Lord and um, put his trust and faith in the Lord later on. But here's what he says about um, 
what we call the remembrance. Verse 23, he writes to the Corinthians and he says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remarkable that separately the Lord revealed to Paul um, the exact same details as to what they should do, as to the importance of, of keeping this remembrance. And it's interesting, I think there's, there's three kind of interesting things that Paul points to. Um, for as often as you eat, we'll say something about that uh, in a moment, but he says here that in doing this we proclaim. It's a proclamation. And it's something maybe I don't know that we, we think a great deal about, but there's a sense in which our keeping the remembrance in the way that the Lord has given it is a gospel proclamation. And it's, it's us um, testifying, it's us coming together as a group of believers, as disciples of the Lord Jesus, here in the Church of God in Mount Forest, and it, it is, is us proclaiming to anybody who wants to pay attention and take notice of what we're doing when we come together, proclaiming. Proclaiming what? The Lord's death as a fact of history. And in that expression, the Lord's death, not just what the, the scripture means by that is his death, burial and resurrection. It's kind of shorthand for that. It's not just about the fact that Jesus died and nothing else, but that we know he came back to life again, uh, was buried, came back to life again and ascended back to heaven again. So it's a proclamation of that truth on an ongoing basis as often as we come together to do this. We are proclaiming that truth and therefore we are proclaiming the gospel in the very fact that we are keeping the remembrance. Isn't that an amazing thing? And a great, um, adds uh, another dimension of importance um, to us doing what we do. And it's until he comes. And that's a reminder to us that the Lord is coming again and a time will come just as it was for the Jewish people a time came when the Passover was no longer necessary a time will come when our keeping the remembrance of the Lord through the bread and wine will no longer be necessary because we'll be in his presence we will see him face to face because he will come and so Paul says we're only doing this until he comes because then we'll be brought into the, the greater reality of seeing the Lord face to face and being with the Lord forever thereafter. So it's, it's a looking back for us in terms of a remembrance in, in our hearts and minds as well as to what the Lord has done for us to be the people that we are, saved people, and for us to be able to come together in the way that we do. But it's also a looking forward because we're only going to do this until he comes. And it's a reminder to us as well. So we've got the remembrance, but we've also got the reminder of what's ahead, uh, which is associated, of course, with the blessed promises of God in relation to the new covenant. And it's the Lord saying, this is what I've done for you. Uh, and I want you never to forget that. And the reason I've done this for you is because of all that this brings you into. And in a sense, just like with the people of Israel, it wasn't just about them getting freed from their slavery and bondage in Egypt. It was about them then having the opportunity of being brought into a place of service and worship in a special relationship with God, taken to a promised land and having God dwell in their presence. And it's the same spiritual truth that uh, the opportunity is made available for believers in the Lord Jesus to be a part of, of what is described as a, uh, a spiritual kingdom. Now, just on this point in the verse here about as for as often as you do this. Since the, I suppose, the reestablishment of biblical, biblically constituted churches of God going back uh, in, in our, the history of our own 
uh, movement is not quite the right word, but you know what I mean by that. Going back to the 1890s, uh, it's been a very clear um, conviction and understanding from the Bible that what this means in essence is that there is a frequency, that there is a regularity that the Lord wants us to observe. So he's not left it to us to kind of figure out, well, what does he mean by as often? How often is often? Is it once a year like they did for the Passover? Is, is, does, does that mean often? Or is it more frequent than that? Um, and different church groups actually obviously have had those kind of thoughts and, and they've come to different conclusions and, and different decisions, which is why um, the Lord's Supper or communion or the remembrance, whatever it may be referred to as in, in some and church groupings is, is kept at a, on a different basis in terms of its uh, frequency. But for us, what we believe the Bible teaches um, is that it's a first day of every week experience, which is why we have gathered together this morning on Sunday, um, first day of the week for us, and we do it every week. And I think these verses in Acts chapter 20, you might not just see the reference there, dropped off the bottom of the screen. Uh, Acts 20 verse 6 and 7. It's just, it's almost a passing comment in, in the narrative of, of what's going on in, in part of the experiences of Paul's travels. And he says, we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread uh, and came to them at Troas within five days. And there we stayed seven days on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. Now, this expression, break bread here, it's clearly not about just gathering together to have a, a meal, to have a church meal kind of thing. And occasionally, that expression is used in, in, in the Bible to mean that. And, and it's even sometimes, in some cultures, a, a, a common expression, you break bread with somebody, means you're, you're having hospitality, you're having fellowship, you're sharing together. But here, it clearly is talking about the the special breaking of the bread that the Lord Jesus did that first night, because why did they wait seven days? That's the thing, isn't it? If they were just wanting to come together for, for a meal, why, why, you, you wouldn't need to wait seven days in order to do that. So there's some significance in that. So they'd arrived where they had uh, the, the, the previous, as, as we might call it Sunday, if it is a Sunday, um, and they waited seven days because they wanted to keep the remembrance with this group of believers, with this church of God. Uh, and so they waited the seven days. So that gives us uh, a, a very good clue. And it might not be, I suppose, in some people's minds, a, a really a slam dunk. It's not like there's a verse in the Bible that says, thou shalt meet every first day of the, of, of the week on the Sunday, and thou shalt celebrate the remembrance. The Lord hasn't stated it in those terms. But we're looking at, well, what did the early believers do? because they were the ones who listened to the teaching of the Lord. And again, we were thinking about um, uh, kingdoms this morning and being in the kingdom of God. And the Lord spent, after his resurrection, we read in Acts chapter 1, he spent 40 days with his, before going back to his Father in heaven, he spent 40 days with his disciples, teaching them the things concerning the kingdom. And so we have got every uh, reasonable um, thought to believe that what the disciples then did, what they put into practice, was, was not on the basis of their own ideas, but because the Lord told them. So we observe clearly when we follow the, this thing through in the, in the New Testament, this is what the early believers in the Lord did, those first churches of God. They met on the first day of the week to keep the remembrance, to break bread together, to keep that command of the Lord. And so that is the example that we follow in churches of God today. And I think, you know, for me, that resonates with what we read about the Lord's earnest desire. You know, he had a, a passion to introduce this remembrance and this, the, the symbolism of the bread and wine. And it was clearly something which was very much on the heart of the Lord. And, and we could well imagine that surely the heart of the Lord at that time, at that moment in time, could have been so occupied with so many other things in terms of what was about to come that only he knew about. He could have been 
um, anxious and stressed, we might say, from a human point of view about all of those things and, and be distracted in his mind about all of those things that were to come. But he set his passion on being with his disciples in order to institute this remembrance. Not for it then to be celebrated just occasionally when it's convenient for us as a group of believers to think, well, let's do it. We've not done it for a while. We ought to do it. And to me, it just kind of dovetails into this as often as you do this. In other words, do it often. And the pattern that we see in the scriptures is we do it weekly on the first day of the week. And that answers to the Lord being passionate about us needing this. And Jeff made reference to that uh, as well about we need this as believers. We need to be able to remember because, again, our human propensity is to forget. And sometimes we might think, you know, those big things in our lives, you know, something so big, so amazing as as knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and appreciating what he's done in order that we can know that, surely that's something that we would never forget. Well, chances are we would actually. We all have big momentous events in our lives and some years down the line we can forget some of those things. We can forget the details and it, and it dulls our appreciation of them when we forget. And so the Lord gave us this so that we would always remember and always stay in touch and stay in tune with what it is to do this in remembrance of him. So I think with that passion that the Lord had, uh, I think it's entirely appropriate and correct for us as disciples gather together in biblically constituted churches of God, forming the kingdom of God and coming together uh, to remember the Lord in the way that he's commanded. Now, just uh, on another point, uh, flip over to Matthew chapter 26, 30, please. So far, then, we, we've thought about um, the, the practicalities or well, why we're using bread and wine. Of course, we know why that is. That's what the Lord did. Uh, and by the way, that's another thing. Uh, the Lord took both emblems. So that's why, simple observation, but an important one. That's why it's just one brother who goes to the table and takes two. I mention that because, again, some other churches, it's different people who, who do that. Um, but the Lord did both. So that's we, we follow that example as well. Uh, so we, we've looked at those practicalities. We've, we've looked at the practicality and, and the, the biblical teaching as to why we do it on the first day of the week. And we do it every week because, again, there's a variety of um, practice in that regard. So Matthew chapter 26, verse 30. Uh, first of all, it says very simply, uh, this is Matthew's account of of. Um, the institution of the remembrance and it says after singing a hymn they went out to the Mount of Olives so they wrapped up their time in the upper room they sang a hymn and then they went out to the Mount of Olives now Hebrews chapter 13 and 15 please it says through him through the Lord Jesus let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name and then first Peter chapter 2 Please, in verse 5, which says, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We know through um, Jewish practice and Jewish tradition that the singing of Psalms, particularly, was an integral part, an integral component of their celebration of the Passover. Uh, and in fact, many people believe, and, and Jewish tradition is, that there's certain sections of the Psalms that we have in our Bibles as well that they would have sung uh, during that occasion. So it was, it was a perfectly natural thing that they would be singing on that occasion. And it's just interesting and significant that after the Lord did what he did, they sang a hymn. And then they went on out to the Mount of Olives. So we keep that thought in our minds and then we come across the verse like Hebrews 13, which talks about the importance of the fruit of lips, the product of our lips, saying something uh, as a sacrifice of praise and linking in with, with what Peter says about believers coming together and forming a spiritual house in which these sacrifices of praises can be made. And we think, well, how does that 
where does all, all of that happen? How do we bring all of that together? Uh, and and when, when do we offer these sacrifices of praise? When does this fruit of lips happen? And what's it got to do with the fact that they sang a hymn uh, in the upper room uh, after they went away? The singing of, of, of songs, of psalms and songs, um, was very much associated with the celebration of the Passover. And, and we have some biblical, some amazing biblical examples of that. You can think of um, King Josiah's great revival Passover in Second Chronicles 35. And there's clear reference made there about getting the singers in place and the singers playing a, a really important role. So um, the, the, the sung expression of thanksgiving and praise was very much part of the Passover celebration. And that then seems to give us a good link as to why they sang that hymn at the end of what the Lord did with the disciples in the upper room. And I think it, it gives us a good link to these other verses about the sacrifice of praise and the fruit of lips. And although, again, this is one of those things where there isn't a specific verse in the Bible that says, this is when you are to do this. Weaving these things together and studying the scriptures with a discerning heart and looking for the leading of the Spirit of God um, over all the generations since the re-establishment of churches of God going back to the 1890s, the elders have had this consistent understanding that the most appropriate time to do that is immediately after the, re the remembrance, the breaking of the bread. It seems such a natural, such an ideal and appropriate opportunity that we then speak our sacrifices of praise or sing our sacrifices of praise and the fruit of lips and we take that opportunity to express uh, what is on our hearts and to bring our worship in that sense and to bring our offerings and of course that is this is the the spiritual fulfillment and counterpart of things that they did under the old covenant so we effectively have what we call the remembrance the Lord's Supper or the communion is, is actually a two component kind of thing, really, isn't it? We've got the, the, the taking of the bread and wine as one thing. And then we've got the expression of praise and thanksgiving. And, it, and it's seamless in a sense, and, and rightly so. We, we, one naturally follows on to the other. Uh, and so that's, that's also why we do things the way we do. And, and giving expression to uh, these verses that speak about having that opportunity and needing to take the opportunity to offer to the Lord a sacrifice of praise. Just in conclusion, one of the first leaders of song in the temple in Jerusalem was a chap called Asaph, and he's, he's written a number of psalms as well. And this is what he says in one of them. We'll just finish with this then, Psalm 77. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are a God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have, by your power, redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. Sila is believed to mean pause and consider. So I'll, I'll leave that with you to pause and consider um, the wonder of our opportunity that is afforded to us to remember the Lord. So we're not coming just out of routine and just because you know, the overseers in the church say you should be doing this. We come because we're fulfilling a command of the Lord and we're honoring the Lord, we're pleasing the Lord, we're remembering the Lord, and we're looking forward to the Lord coming again. And it's a, well, we're truly blessed and privileged to have that opportunity.